start now. That's a new thing for Zoom. Yeah. I don't know if you all heard that, but <laughs> yeah. it's meaning. Okay. So yeah, awesome. Amazing to see so many people here again for our second webinar on accessible skate parks. Um, yeah, uh, the first one was in February. That was really cool and people were stoked to do something again. Um, yeah, my name is Rhiannon. I'm the Good Push Alliance Program Manager at Skatistan. I am not at all an expert on this topic, <laughs> but uh, various people have wanted to, to, yeah, basically have some events and talk about it. And so we're happy to be able to yeah, provide a platform and bring people together. Um, yeah, today we'll have uh, a few other uh, co-hosts. So we have um, David Lebousset. I think I say that wrong every time. Yeah. <laughs> Sit and skate. <laughs> Is that right? Le Bousset? Le Bousset, but Le it's Bousset. okay. I can live with it. <laughs> yeah. And I think you, a lot of you know David already. Um, also very, very good uh, WCMXer. And then we also have uh, Linda Ritterhoff here. As yeah, the last name doesn't matter. And I uh, work <laughs> for two organizations and basically I just skate. Yeah, she skates. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, Miriam is helping. She's helped put this together. So props to Miriam this year. Um, yeah, so awesome. We will be, yeah, just trying to, I mean, keep it open. We, we like to have the discussion going. We have um, three really cool projects, like three organizations that are doing really cool projects related to uh, accessible skate parks, adapted skate parks today. And so we're going to hear from each of them. Um, On music playing um <laughs> yeah so we're gonna hear from each of them for they'll do like a kind of a presentation about what they're working on and then we'll have yeah time to for you to ask some questions and find out more and then we'll have like a more open discussion at the at the very end as well um we plan to basically um run this for definitely an hour and then last time we ran it a little bit extra because there just was more stuff to talk about so we'll do a sort of mini wrap up at an hour and then people can stay if you want after that um can everybody please um it's a good time to mention it but can everybody please make sure that they're on mute um unless you're speaking so uh, after the presentations we'll ask people if they want to ask questions you can do the use the raise hand feature um i don't know if people know where that is i believe if you click um if anyone knows you're welcome to tell me because i <laughs> okay know. on the button there's like a field in german it's reactionen reactions i think and there's a button for the raised hand ah, nice <laughs> thanks linda i've got all kinds of screens open here Nice. All right. So that's how you do it. You can also, we really encourage you to use the chat function throughout and just, yeah, say your, if someone said something and you want to comment on it or add something or share something, uh, definitely feel free to chat and don't worry about, I don't know, if you want to go on a bit of a tangent in the chat, that's okay. And also you can ask questions in the chat as well. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the plan for today. So we'll we'll hear from uh, three organizations. Um, firstly, you will hear from New Line Skate Parks. We'll have several people uh, from there. Um, they'll introduce themselves in their section. And um, they're working in the USA, Canada, and elsewhere. And then we have the Swedish Skateboard Federation, um, Frederick Eng Engener and Nicholas Bostrom here uh, speaking about their survey research project. And then Alt Root Project, which is um, Curtis Ruddle and Matt Jans based in Canada. So yeah, we're really excited to get started. Um, yeah, so I guess um, going into uh, New Line's presentation, so I'll just give a bit of a background on them. Sorry, I want to, don't wanna miss anything. Um, yeah, so if you don't know of them already, New Line Skate Parks is an internationally renowned um, municipal skate park design and construction team, full service. I don't know what that means, but I guess that's covering everything. <laughs> and then they have been working already on almost 400 skate park projects and have more than 20 years of concrete skate park development experience. So um, yeah, 
during this event, they want to share what their process is and their approach to accessibility in skate parks. So I think this will be really interesting. I, I'm aware of New Line because uh, at Skatistan, we partnered with them on some, they built some of our skate parks, um, one in South Africa and just recently one in Afghanistan. So yeah, excited to have them here. Um, so I'll pass it over. I believe um, Everett is going to, or no. Uh, yeah. Kyle's going to start. Kyle's going to start. Anyways, I'll hand it to you thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Rhiannon. and we really, uh, we truly appreciate you having us on today. I'm just going to be setting up the PowerPoint and then handing it over to Kyle Dion. He's going to introduce us. Thanks, everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, my name's Kyle. Uh, I guess uh, I heard her friend of the New Land Parks. Sorry, um, Kyle. Where we have really bad audio from you. I'm not sure what happened. It sounds a bit gremlin-y. Do you have a... Uh, different mic option. See if it works better without the headphones. Maybe the battery's dying in those buds. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? Can you guys hear me now? Oh man, so much better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. It wouldn't be a Zoom presentation without some sort of technological challenges to kick us off, right? Um, but yeah, I was just saying, my name is Kyle. I'm the, the founder and current president of New Line Skate Parks. Um, also the vice president of Canada Skateboard, which is our uh, national sporting organization for skateboarding in Canada. So um, spend a lot of time talking about uh, skate parks and skateboarding and all sorts of forms and fashions all day long for the past uh, 25 years or so. Um, we also have uh, Everett, who's our you know, uh, marketing manager and community uh, outreach liaison, and then Ryan and Canton from our U.S. Uh, design team on board here to help answer some questions. So we just put together a short presentation here. If you want to move to the next slide, Everett. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit about, um, you know, ADA and ACA, so um, and how those affect some of the work that we have been doing. Um, and some of our evolving philosophies as we're, we're learning and, and pushing ourselves to learn um, about the needs of all, all different user groups in these things. So um, our philosophy on accessibility um, and then talk about some projects we're working on with Dan um, and some other exciting projects that are they're coming and some technologies and things like that. So uh, go ahead, Eric. Um, so you got the intro. I mean, we've uh, as New Life Skate Parks, we've done over 400 projects, but our team, we brought Canton and, and his team from Stantec uh, on board not too long ago. We also merged with a company called Spectrum Skate Parks in Canada and Missiano Skate Parks out of Florida. So collectively, our team has been involved in over a thousand uh, projects around the world. So we have a pretty extensive team of designers and builders, and we're about 65 people full time that just design and build skate parks all day. Uh, we also work with a lot of uh, NGOs. Um, as Rihanna mentioned, we just got back from Afghanistan. We had four people, uh, plus some of our friends from Concrete Jungle Foundation went up there and built an amazing park out there. Um, but we work with a lot of different organizations doing different uh, groundbreaking research and, and programming and, and all sorts of things like that. So um, ourselves as the company owners and uh, our staff are very sort of um, dedicated to sort of the social skate movement. And so we use our commercial projects to help push some of these initiatives forward. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so in the last presentation, I was actually kind of, I was just listening in the background, but I was kind of shocked when a, an example was brought up about a project in California where um, wheelchair athletes, you know, came up to the park and couldn't get into it. And, it surprised me because I know that since the beginning and all of the projects that we've worked on, uh, I'm sure you know a lot of you are familiar with uh, ADA, which is the American Disabilities Act, or in Canada it's called the Accessible Canada Act. Um, but basically, there's you know a set of uh, national standards, um, you know, or rules, um, you know, for accessibility, and it's enforced through sort of local and national building codes. Um, and as the quote there says, organizations that serve the public must remove architectural barriers when it is readily achievable to do so. Um, and so, 
you know, this kind of gets applied to, you know, and especially municipal projects or government projects more so than anything. But, um, you know, we've always focused on, um, and, and in the beginning, we kind of resisted it a little bit because as skate plazas and street parks and stuff started to evolve and you started to see more stairs and railings and things like that in skate parks, it was very, uh, not very clear how to apply these standards to skateboarding facilities because, for example, we didn't want our rails the typical height and we didn't want kinks at the bottom and, you know, stair treads might not be the common thing and stuff like that. So, you know, in the early days, we actually fought against ADA from a point of applying it to an entire skate park, but we always, you know, were very careful about making sure that there was access, you know, from the parking lot or the pathway to the park, to staging areas, to viewing areas and things like that. So, so these very, you know, I guess minimum standards would be very clear about access. And I'll show you a few examples of what that looks like um, in terms of just applying basic ADA requirements. So this is a project in Frisco, Texas. Can you flip to the next one, Everett? Thanks. Uh, so you can see here, very basic, you know, we got some, some, um, uh, accessible parking stalls here in the parking lot and then making sure that we got you know pathway access to every main elevation within the park uh, we have areas where you can get up next to the bowl and see what's happening um, accessible routes to get to sort of the the picnic pavilion uh, to the washrooms and things like that so you know most parks you'll see do you know a pretty good job of getting people sort of in and around the park um, obviously, the bowls are still, you know, once you get in there, um, you, you kind of have to wait, make your way out of there. And in this case, it's just a big open street area and everything's kind of connected. Um, you want to go to the next slide? So here's another project. Uh, sorry, one more, Everett. This is one we're building right now. Uh, again, this one's in Texas as well. Um, and so we have pedestrian sort of circulation in and through the park. This connects, you know, to the accessible path into the rest of the park as a water park and, and, and uh, playground and fields and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, we always make sure that, you know, the spectator seating areas, most of the drop-in areas, most of the main elevations of the park, um, you can get access into. Um, also, you know, at this end, like there's a quarter pipe and there's mellow ramps, you know, up either side. And uh, this area here is actually a specific sort of learning beginner area where it's just small banks and quarter pipes and an open mini ramp and an outdoor classroom for teaching lessons and stuff like that. Um, so again, this is just, you know, um, I guess doing a good job of applying the minimum standards of ADA um, requirements, I would say. You still, you got an enclosed bowl kind of thing, but there are some roll-ins and stuff, but once you're in the bowl, you're kind of in the bowl. Um, go to the next slide. So this is a project that we did in Banff um, National Park. And so it's interesting for a number of different reasons, but for one, um, you know, there's major sort of elk and wildlife migration through this site. So we uh, wow. designed this bowl in a way that there's no areas that you could get trapped in. So uh, can you advance the slide to the next one? Well, again, this gave, gave us an opportunity to do something where there's certain drop-in points and roll-in points, but you can get out of the bowl or get out of the areas if you ever needed to. Uh, so there's no enclosed areas or trapped areas. Um, and again, just very clear, you know, access up to the viewing points and, you know, staging areas, set down areas, and, and clear lines of traffic in the street course, for example. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of touch on that evolution. You know, in the beginning, ADA and ACA sort of standards or requirements were very confusing how to apply them to skate parks. And then we found this sort of happy medium where we really worked on making sure that, you know, through signage and wayfinding that you know the park was you could at least get to the park and get to the main areas and those kinds of things but i think what we're learning now what we're discovering is like how do we sort of push this way beyond just like the basic or, or minimum ada requirements i think as a as a minimum standard we definitely shouldn't see what we saw in that one project where you can't even get to a park um but yeah i'm going to let everett talk a little bit about 
you know, working with Dan and some of the things that we're seeing that can really help sort of take things to the next level. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I think this is where things are really starting to get exciting. And it was so incredible to see the athletes uh, in Des Moines in this last due tour just show and really highlight what is possible in these spaces. And so now I think the next phase of development is, again, just really going off beyond ADA and ACA. And how do we facilitate and encourage full participation of all users where it's a space that everyone can thrive and participate um, and meet very specific needs of each group. So going into some of the project examples that I'm going to share, um, it's been a really, really steep learning curve uh, for us working with folks like Dan Mancina, who you know, is really good at communicating his specific needs for skateboarding, but then sort of opening the Pandora's box of, of all the different needs of each specific group and how do we facilitate that all within one space. Um, so that really comes down to working with experts in the field, working with athletes, working with individuals to sort of help form the future of adaptive and inclusive skate parks is how do we take their knowledge and their experience and turn that into spaces. And I know Curtis, who's on the call, and Matt sort of are actively working and doing some research on what do these adaptations look like. So how do we partner with groups like Altroot and folks like Dan and, and, and uh, you know, high performing athletes and beginning athletes to make these spaces truly inclusive? So that's sort of where we talk about the future of adaptive skate parks. So um, I met Dan a few years ago. We brought him up uh, into Canada to run a workshop introducing about 30 uh, youth uh, with varying visual impairments uh, to introducing them to skateboarding in a skate park. Um, since then, you know, we've had a close friendship and working relationship, and he's taught me so much about um, adaptive skateboarding and his needs specifically. Right now we're working with him to help design a private facility at his house in Michigan um, that he wants to use a, as you know, a training ground for himself, but also a place to run workshops, invite families um, and introduce children uh, with visual impairments to skateboarding. So I'm not, I don't want to get too much into the details on his project because I think a lot's going to be coming out in the near future. Um, but it's been a, a really, like I said, a really steep learning curve of, of sort of adapting designs specifically to Dan's needs. And even, you know, one of the, one of the big points uh, learning for us is we've sort of, over the last 20 years, um, we've developed calculations and standards for appropriate offsets between obstacles and spacing of obstacles um, and then through talking with someone like Dan is that simply just doesn't work for him. Um, a big open skate park is a bit of a nightmare for him without having, you know, significant wayfinding places. He doesn't need a large run up to a ledge. He needs a ledge to be very long and spacious, something that he can find easily. Um, so just making some of those adjustments in the physical space uh, to adapt to those needs. Um, has been a, an awesome challenge. And I know uh, Ryan and Canton and all of our designers are really learning from that experience. So that sort of takes us into an uh, opportunity that has come up uh, in Fort Myers, Florida. And this, is, this park is just being proposed. So I need to um, sort of put that out front um, that this is a perspective project that is, that is being proposed to the County of Fort Myers. And through that, we're working with the Department of Blind Services, who is very passionate about sort of developing a public adaptive park that is a destination for local athletes, but also sort of a North American destination uh, for adaptive athletes to come to, to compete, to host events. Um, really, really exciting stuff. So just looking at the general layout, it can on the surface look like a typical skate park, but when you really start looking at the terrain, 
through an accessibility lens, there are some significant changes. Like I said, longer ledges, um, uh, bigger run-up spaces, uh, roll-on features uh, for wheelchair access, um, obvious accessibility to the park. The park has been broken down into a grid for simple wayfinding. Um, but the layout is just one aspect of the adaptive park. And I think where it gets really exciting is when we hope to bring this working group together of experts in the field and athletes is material choices and technological adaptations is how do we, how does this space function uh, through an adaptive lens? So easy, like uh, easy things. Sorry, I think we're picking something up here. Sounds like a police scanner. Um, so the, are we good, Rhiannon? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to mute somebody here. But yes, okay. thanks. So. Okay, I'll continue in the in the interim. So the physical landscape is is one thing. Adapting to you know extra wide ride on features ramp access to all elevation, accessible in and out features of any of our bowls so you can easily get in and out. But then we start looking at the ground, we start looking at colors, we start looking at textures as wayfinding. So integrating texture and color throughout the skate park as wayfinder for uh, low visibility, uh, low vision um, or blind. And so you can feel the textures on the ground and you'll know where you are in the park. Uh, integrated lighting to highlight visible features. So again, adding to that super high contrast um, that you can really distinguish one feature from another. I've uh, been really inspired by Justin Bishop's uh, journey using uh, sound technology. So embedding sound technology as a wayfinder in the skate park, that's something that can be installed and integrated full time. Um, and creating a soundscape within the skate park that allows wayfinding. Um, and again, that's something Justin's gonna know way more than we know about. So our hope would be to work with someone like Justin and, and you know, plan that integration. Um, having three-dimensional printed maps um, on plinths throughout the skate park. So anywhere you can find the plinth, you can find a map to the skate park and it's 3D printed and, um, uh, and it's a form of wayfinding or mapping. Um, sensory features within skate zones um, for individuals with sensory processing difficulties. Um, and so youth, children, adults with sensory processing, autism, um, having you know, features within the park that meet their sensory needs, but also help them navigate the park as they move through it so they're not sort of in the wrong places at the at the wrong time. So I'll go through this really quickly. Again, we're just talking about different uh, textures to guide and to flow through the park. Easy access to all of the features. Um, it, you know, very clear in and outs of any of the bowl structures. High contrast. Um, again, as a way of wayfinding. Um, and, and distinguishing one area from another, very clear viewing and staging areas. This idea of integrated, you know, three-dimensional sound technology as wayfinding. Um, again, uh, not something that, that we know in depth, but something that we would bring an expert on, um, like the folks from, uh, I think impossible, Justin would know, impossible uh, sound, who, the sound engineers that he brought on to develop this uh, three-dimensional sound technology for him. Um, and then some ride on, ride in, and ride out uh, features that are, that are highly accessible. So again, this is just scratching the surface of what we think is possible. I think all of this right now is very conceptual and will really come to life, um, you know, when we bring in a team of experts, athletes, and all get around the same table and, and speak to some of those highly individualized adaptations that need to be uh, considered. 
So that is just our quick 10 minute overview of uh, accessible skate parks and you know what we think is possible in the future. What I am most excited about is um, you know, with the rise of adaptive uh, athletes and events like Dew Tour, this is going to be a need to be a consideration in every skate park, which is amazing that, that we can now go on to our next 400 projects with an adaptive lens in mind. Um, and that uh, those considerations need to be made for any successful public skate park. So yeah, I think... That's it for us, and we're going to field a few questions if anyone has them. Okay, ah, my voice. First of all, thank you, and that was really impressive. And I can say that my questions all have been answered already, but I know I see that there's one question by Claire. Hi, guys. Um, hi, I'm Claire. I'm here just as my in as a skateboarder, but also I'm on the board of Skateboard GB and um, I knew nothing about this. I wasn't able to join the first session, but really excited to be here today. This might be a, a stupid question, um, but I'll ask it anyway. One thing that you mentioned, I suppose one thing that's, that I was wondering is, is what, what's best? And it might be that the answer is a, a combination of things, but you, you presented, for example, that latest project looks absolutely amazing as an accessible skate park. Um, and then you also mentioned around essentially considering um, those those accessibility points within every skate park. Is it should we be looking to create specific skate parks? Is that is that better? Is it better to try and integrate accessibility in every skate park? Um, I imagine the answer to that last one is yes. But is is should it also be a goal to look to to create you know specific skate parks that are very much built uh built for that i hope that makes sense as a question i'm just trying to think you yeah. know is, is it more yeah. about kind of uh, is the ultimate aim full kind of integration or actually you know if you look at it realistically in terms of costs in terms of you know whatever materials used etc is it actually probably a combination of both where in an ideal world you also have quite specific accessible skate parks absolutely that's a that's a great question actually um, because it's one of the greatest challenges we face as skate park designers, um, because we, we've, we've yet to build a park that I think is big enough for the community that it goes in. So let alone the challenge of trying to, you know, you got bowl skaters, you got street skaters, you got, you know, bike riders, all these kinds of things normally, and you can't make everybody happy no matter what, right? So you're already trying to do those things. So um, I, I think that there's a layer of, yes, like every park should have you know, some minimum thing, like those ADA things that I spoke about in the beginning should just, those shouldn't even be a question. Every park should have that. And then what you can do where it's appropriate for sure, but it's always going to be a challenge of how do you spend the limited dollars that you have in the limited area that you have. And what we've been doing a lot is, is getting into more skate park master plans. Um, we're doing one for the city of Vancouver right now. And we've done, you know, city of Calgary and, and numerous ones uh, around North America where, within a skate park system these are the needs of all the users within the system so you might not be able to accommodate it in every single park because some might just be neighborhood skate spots or skate dots or smaller parks and some are like the des moines one which is just this massive expanse of you know eighty eight thousand square feet so i think at every different level there might be different things that are possible but within a skate park system when you look at it holistically absolutely you should have facilities that you know might just accommodate beginner riders or might just accommodate adaptive athletes or might just you know might be more you know maybe there is one facility that's just way more gnarly bowls and things like that so yeah you, you might not be able to see it in every single skate park ever but within a skate park system and within an, a reasonable sort of area you know our vision is to see these the, the types of things that all the different user groups need close enough that they can get access to it so try, trying to be realistic about what's possible in the intern and building towards this sort of global goal of making sure that there's a lot more of these things available. Does yeah, that, that, does that answer sense. the question? Yeah, that's actually really useful. I think I've never lived somewhere where there's a skate park system, to, you know, to that extent. Mm -hmm. So, but that makes total sense, I think. And, and I suppose you can make that, that system can be 
larger or smaller, depending on how many. Yeah, so, and how many so the city of Calgary, areas. for example, when we when we did the research, they realized that they needed 48 skate parks and like, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet to meet the needs of what they determined was the skater base just in Calgary alone. So obviously they couldn't do all of that, but they put $4.5 million and they built 12 skate parks all together as part of the beginning of the system. And I know some of you guys are in Calgary and it's not perfect, but by the time that full system is built out over, let's say the next 10 or 15 years, hopefully, you know, indoor parks and this and that, like all those things will exist within the system, but it'll take time to get there. I would like to answer um, part of the question from a perspective of a pe uh, people with disability. So, um, I think that not every skate park can make everybody happy and maybe never will. But um, if there's a possibility to uh, have everything at least in one space or one place, that um, would be good. Because uh, if we start to make like, that's the wheelchair park, that's the BMX park, that's the skateboard park, then we go back from the uh, thing we call inclusion. So that's not what we want. So it should be definitely the, the goal to have it at one place. Then when there's the space, we could talk about, okay, uh, there's the part for the skateboarder for street, like we do with street and, and park. So also we could do, okay, there's more for, for the wheelchair users. There's more for the blind skateboarders. So that might make sense as long as you still meet at the same place. Um, or, of course, if you have a city with so many skate parks, um, you could, of course, see, okay, that one skate park is more for this group and the other one for, 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 for them, but um, we should not separate them uh, in general. I yeah, think, that's, I think, that's really useful. Sorry. I think that's a great point, David, and, I, and it's even something just at the different user group levels to accommodate in a skate park is uh, everyone needs an entry point into that space. Like where do, where does someone get started if it's their first day, uh, you know, engaging, but we also don't want to cap or limit their personal progression. Um, you know, you look at the rise of adaptive athletes and like what, um, wheels was doing at do tour, um, you know, thank goodness he's got like that massive ball with a vert wall. And it's like, who are we to say what's possible? <laughs> so if we don't want to, we don't want to design everything to have a limit, um, uh, you know, or we don't want to cap people at a certain, at a certain level, but we do want to give everyone an entry point to get started, a safe, inclusive space to get started. I love, I love whatever it just said. Um, Cause just speaking from the perspective of a disabled person, we're like wetting the appetite right now of mm. people who have been limited from movement for their entire life. So who, who knows where these kids are going to take um, their skateboarding skills as we continue to include them in the space. So whatever it said, not, not capping their abilities is going to be, that's going to be a huge thing to think about in just like five years. Yeah. I mean, we've, uh, I will say this, that, um, you know, skate parks and other kind of wheel friendly spaces have evolved a lot over the years. And I just think that this is just a continued evolution of where we're going to go. Um, I like what Lily's comment was in the chat here about, you know, and tying into what David said to you about not segregating people and making them feel just, you know, treat them like everyone else. And, you know, sometimes maybe the accessibility could be more subtle, but I think you probably all have seen a lot of progression and evolution on creating spaces that are, you know, allowing to have, you know, not the barriers that had back, but, you know, just like what Kyle said in the beginning, you know, for a park in 20, you know, 2020 opening up in the last year or so to not allow people at least have access into the park, hopefully those things will evolve and kind of go away and it'll just become common practice. So, you know, we've come a long way, we still have a long way to go and hearing from people on meetings like this is gonna help inform us on how to make them better. Thank you. Tracy was raising her hand for ages. Uh, um, my, my take on unaccessible skate parks uh, can be a little bit different. Um, my feeling is that I would find great joy in going to a far up a park, a park and finding maybe a hubba I could launch myself off of. Um, I, I'm also the kind of person who I'm not really a street skater, but but can I? Apparently, yes. 
Um, I find great joy into launching myself into combi bowls. Um, can I crawl out? Yes. So within our disabled community, we do have a different variety. So if we do make the whole park, um, you know, it, it, you know, it, within our disabled community, we have so many abilities. Um, so you, you let's all share. So um, I find nothing but great joy than launching myself off a vert wall. So, um, you know, it just, I always make sure I can get help or, or, or crawl myself out. But things like that, when we do go to a skate park, let's just get in and out. And the beginner area for a regular skateboarder is very similar to a beginner area for a wheelchair skateboarder, or possibly I do not know what it's, what it's like to be, well, I do know what it's like to be visually challenged, but not standing up on a skateboard. So, you know, within our disabled community, we all have different abilities. So, you know, it's not just that we're in a wheelchair or we're blind, there's, there's other things involved. So if I go somewhere and I can get up on a ledge, um, I was at Alex Road one time and I'm trying to drop in from this one area, lo and behold, I do a turn and I'm back off the top. Um, so yeah, you know, just finding a hidden gem in a skate park to me is golden. Um, if I find a rail that I can ride in a park, um, that is, you know, that would be just awesome. Or if I can get speed somewhere to do something and, and launch myself off of something, that was absolutely golden in Des Moines. Um, I could launch myself off of places quite naturally. Um, so yeah, you know, we're all looking for different things. So to, to take a whole park and just, you know, just finding those hidden places um, to me is golden, but that's just my take on it. So, and, and having contrasting um, things because things, you know, I, I have visual issues too. So the contrasting colors can be confusing, but, but on sharp edges, they're golden. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Alec, you don't want to say something anymore, right? Your hand was gone. Oh, I was, you know, I, I think it's all, Inside. Wonderful to, to hear all this stuff. Uh, it was just a reminder that the, in this skate park advocacy advocacy community, when you have a sorry cat, of course, uh, needs in the community, the people have to show up to the meetings when they're making the skate parks. If so, even in any case where the BMX rider or uh, anybody says, "Why didn't you make this?" well you weren't at the meeting and that hel it helps tremendously for people to show up and advocate for their needs locally it also helps when uh skate park builders or uh, designers are helping at the citywide plan level um but for anything like this if the more that people can uh, show up and be vocal for their own skate parks or just advocate for the skate park themselves they can help steer that ideally but it's meetings like this and, and materials that come out of meetings like this that help everybody see that these are considerations that have to be uh, taken in, into thought. Yeah, that's, it. that's true. Um, I'm a bit sorry because we have to watch the time. Is it okay if uh, Justin is the last one to say something and we have some time for a discussion in the end? And you just save in your head what you wanted to say. Tracy, that would be okay for you? Okay. Okay, then Justin, please. Oh, yeah. My, is my speaker on? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, one thing, I, I loved uh, everything you guys are inputting to uh, the future courses with the grooves and stuff like that. Um, one thing I didn't hear that is a simple tool is a miniature version of the skate park to touch and feel. Um, to get an understanding of the flow of the park and um, different features in it. Like in Des Moines, that bowl was so massive that my brain still can't wrap its head around some of the curves, some of the transition, some of the uh, other side of the park I only touched half of the park, if that. Uh, so maybe just like a, a miniature feature of the park that the blind visually impaired can feel like in front of the park to understand what they're about to get into. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and um, 
Yeah, I, one one thing that we did talk about, and I know have had conversations with Ben Rubin, who's on the call, and with Dan, is different ways to form those three dimensional maps and how to set them in permanently into a park um, for wayfinding. So yeah, that's a that's an awesome point. And I know we're over time. One thing I just wanted to say uh, in closing that I think the beautiful thing I, that really attracted me to skating growing up was uh, this lens of taking what appears to be a barrier and reappropriating it as something beautiful and something meaningful. And that's the beauty in skateboarding and watching what was happening in Des Moines and watching the rise of adaptive athletes. It's like that times 10. It's taking physical barriers and, and again, reappropriating them um, to something amazing. So I just, yeah, feel privileged to be on the call. Thank you for having us. Um, look forward to connecting with everyone. Awesome. Thanks everybody. And yeah, really cool to see the discussion happening. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll move on to the second project we're going to hear from um, coming from a, a different angle. So uh, we have white architecture and the Swedish skateboard federation who in 2019 did a research project that was focusing on how skate parks and skateboarding could become more inclusive through design. And in this original report, the scope of their inclusivity was focused on gender inclusion. I guess they'll talk about, a bit that, about that more. So the non-cis male perspective, but now they have some additional funding to uh, continue this research and they wanna broaden their scope. So I think they wanna get some input and uh, yeah, we'll hear what they have to say. So over to you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. Can everybody see? Okay, cool. Um, first of all, thank you for hosting such a great event and uh, letting us share this project. And uh, it's also super interesting to learn about this and to hear from New Line Skate Parks about their work. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about this um, study we did in 2019. Sorry, I think someone can everybody mute? Oh, thank you, Raina. <clears throat> so um, the aim of this report we did was, like Raina said, to explore how skate parks could become more inclusive through design. And we who did this is me, Frederick Eigner. I'm a landscape architect and I have a background in skate park design, uh, work at White Architecture, White Architecture, which is one of Sweden's biggest um, architecture practices. And also from White is Rebecca Rubin, who's not with us today, but she's um, a specialist within norm creative design and also an architect. And then maybe Niklas, you wanna, maybe you wanna present yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Niklas Bolström and I'm, uh, I work at the Swedish Skateboarding Federation as a equality and organization developer. And the Swedish Skateboard Federation is the national organization for skateboarding in Sweden. Uh, with a lot of different skateboard clubs as members and uh, are the ones who decide what we are going to do. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk a bit why we did the, the report and the study. Uh, so in Sweden, there are about 200 plus skate parks built through, during the last 15 years. Uh, and uh, we think that the Olympus is going to increase the number of skate parks in Sweden, the, the interest for skateboarding. I could say uh, skateboarding is the only sport in Sweden that uh, has grown during the pandemic. So it's kind of a big hype around skateboarding in Sweden. Uh, but you also can see the overrepresentation of boys and men in skate parks and skateboard clubs and in skateboard design. And there's uh, limited research, research on uh, skate and inclusive design. Uh, and there's no guidelines in Sweden. Like our municipalities have guidelines for all other uh, athletic areas they're going to build, but nothing for skateboarding. Um, so we started with this study to spark a debate about the import importance of inclusivity uh, in the design process of skatable spaces. So that's shortly about how, well, uh, why. Yeah, uh, and I'm uh, going to say how we did it. So. We chose the methods of doing this uh, via workshops uh, and with, with non-normative skateboarders. And yeah, like Rhino said, in this case, we uh, limited to like a non-cis male 
uh, expert group that we did uh, workshops with. We had an older group and a younger group. Um, and they were led and designed by uh, Rebecca, who is uh, one of Sweden's leading experts within this field, uh, inclusive design and, and public space. So super uh, fortunate for us to have a, her at our office. And uh, together with two other specialists, she uh, led these uh, or facilitated these workshops. And this was in order to create a, like a safe and inclusive space and remove the hidden power structures that could potentially arise if, say, me and Nicholas as normative skateboarders would um, hold the workshops. Uh, and after that, we would analyze and interpret the results and try to translate this into design parameters, factors. Uh, and it could be mentioned that we also did like a, an analysis of skate parks in Stockholm, uh, like a deeper contextual study uh, on inclusive designs. Um, we're going to talk, talk a little bit about that later. Um, and uh, we, we learned a lot of things, but one thing that the, the expert groups talked about were the feelings when it comes to skateboarding and of course there's positive feelings like a sense of community it's fun it's the feeling of freedom happiness but one quote that stood out and uh, I think says a lot is uh, I feel freedom on the board but not in the skate park and uh, to, to enhance that quote they also talked about barriers to be able to feel this freedom within the skate park and some of the barriers are feeling stared at uh, feeling unsafe feeling cornered and feeling incapable and feeling excluded and uh, we think that a lot of these barriers can be addressed through design and in how you think about the different objects where the skate park is placed and so on and so forth and we're gonna Fred is going to talk more about that and the results. Yeah, so some of our results then, um, we had two modules. One was, uh, the, the first one was about emotions and feelings uh, to try to identify needs and challenges. And then with the second module, which was um, more focused on the scalable spaces and what uh, our expert groups uh, would like in a scalable space. So I'm just going to go through our results here. So when it comes to spatial factors, it, it, they found it important that it would be like a large open space. Uh, so not too small because then you, you it's just too easy for like one or two riders to just dominate the surface. Uh, there should also be like a variation of zones. So spaces within the space where you can, even, even if it's crowded, you can still find your little gem um it's good if it's multifunctional and the design is sort of integrated so an object could have multiple uses uh so it's not too doesn't so you suggest rather than direct right so uh that's preferable and the location is very important that it's central and accessible um preferably close to public tra transport of course um it's really good if there's some type of a clubhouse or cafe where there's presence of official people, uh, which obviously helps to create some type of a safety aspect, uh, maybe a sense of community. Uh, and it's also important to consider uh, many skatable sections and so not just like one or two tracks uh, to try and, uh, if there's many sections to skate, that's preferable as well. Uh, regarding architecture to be inspiring, colorful and interesting shapes and forms like we can see in Brother Plaza, they have secret hidden messages like love, uh, stuff like that they really liked. Um, it's also good if it's green, lush and cozy, that it's a nice atmosphere to place. And if they preferred also that it's, uh, rather than just having like a concrete desert, if you could break it up into more materials, like have a, because different materials feel different to skate, uh, they, and it, it just helps breaking up the space, um, which links into this sort of organic aesthetic that they often would bring out to, uh, rather than a very strict and sort of framed 
space. They li liked it when it was more organic. Uh, and also if there's a possibility to make your mark, maybe move around objects a little bit more free like that. And they also brought up the possibility to play music is important and that there could be some type of a weather protection or a roof over an outdoor skate park where you could, if you travel a long way and it started to rain, you could still keep the session going. Regarding objects, uh, one thing uh, would be that it's uh, it's important with the gradient between like easy and advanced objects. So not a skate park would only like deep bowls. That, that's not very um, inclusive, according to these experts. So uh, quite obvious. And creative and a reinterpretable objects. So again, this suggest, su uh, uh, suggests rather than directing. And then they brought some pretty concrete uh, suggestions like having just like a simple handrail or something you can hold on to while practicing balance or ollies. And then maybe have like a roll in in, in uh, bowls and quarter pipes. And uh, if you could build your own things, that would also be fun. So here are a few examples that came up during um, the um, sessions and which then the results ended up in a, in a sketch that we did sort of a, a vision sketch where we tried to combine all these factors into uh, something tangible and this what's funny about this sketch is that it's on the both sides of the spectrum it's this very strong feelings a lot of people love it uh, and a lot of people think that it's like oh this is not what a skate park looks like so I guess the lesson is that uh, many people have a like, very fixed idea of what a skate park is, but there really are no rules. Uh, and there's, there could also be a gradient between like, maybe it's a public space that has more uses, or it's just a very programmed skate park that's just single use facility. So um, just wanted to show that. And maybe Nick, so you can talk about the next step. Yeah, uh, as you heard from the beginning, we are trying to take the next step or we got the funds to do it. And uh, we want to expand the framework and explore more perspectives so we can have a more intersectional uh, aspect of the report. So uh, we can have a more holistic view on building inclusive skate parks. Uh, and the aim is to design and build a skate park and test the method and the results in reality uh, in co-creation with uh, a region, a local skateboard club and municipality. And uh, in Sweden, we have like sports districts, like every district in Sweden have their own like federation uh, who can fund the different uh, athletic areas and such. Um, and in that pro process of building that skate park and, and being a part of it, uh, we want to develop guidelines because, as, as I said in the beginning, in Sweden, the municipalities, the skateboard clubs, and skateboard uh, creators, there's, there's no guidelines to, to hold on to. Uh, we want to develop some kind of guidelines that all have that holistic view on how you can build an inclusive skate park. So, especially for municipalities, because in Sweden, they know how to build an ice hockey rink. They know how to build a soccer field and they know how to build other athletic areas. But skate parks, uh, there's so many different ways to build a skate park. So we need to give them some kind of guidelines that still uh, make it possible to do all those different types of skate parks, but still gives some kind of something to hold on to, to make it inclusive and uh, make sure uh, the taxpayer dollars or what you would say goes to to the people skating and uh, not to some uh, I could give an example sometimes there are people who have been skating since the 70s who get to build their dream skate parks with taxpayer dollars and that's not maybe the, the best thing uh, for the public spaces uh, the funding for the next step comes from the Swedish Sports Confederation. That's the like umbrella uh, organization for all sports in Sweden. Uh, and then White Research Lab, that's a, a part of White Architects. And from uh, the Swedish Skateboard Federation. And one thing is we're also going to do is to translate the report that it is into English. And uh, the next step is also going to be be uh, available in English, so it's easier to take take part of uh, what the results and what we're doing. 
so that's the next step that's ongoing actually uh, we're already started and trying to find that region and skateboard club and municipality that uh, is willing to do this with us exactly so we uh, we would uh, <laughs> really need your input here to how we can uh, spend this money right and uh, make sure that we develop something that makes skate parks better for everyone in the future so please come with questions and input and of course uh be free feel free to reach out to us or we can reach out to you to take this further after this session because we don't have too much time i guess <laughs> but uh any questions just a, a little observation here just it's really good i'm, I'm also a in Sweden, based in Sweden, it's great to hear that your project's going forward. Frederick and Nicholas have been following it from two years back. And uh, I, I think what you're doing is great. So I'm just championing. Hi, David. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. I might have a project that you might be able to get involved with, but we can take that separate. Sounds good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we have some questions, if nobody else has uh, questions yet. Um, but first I wanted to say um, that I really like the approach. So I um, think skate parks should be creative spaces. So um, even we need some guidelines, it still should have enough room for creativity. And um, so I really like your point that a skate park can be more like maybe some people consider how a skate park has to be. So I really love it. And there's like uh, good examples of different approaches. What I really love is um, there is a skate plaza in uh, Innsbruck. It's, um, I don't know the name right now, but uh, that's the like- white, the, Yeah, I know the one. Yeah, and, and I, I really love it. So it's an open space where everybody can meet, skate or just have lunch there. And so, when a skate park can also be a, a space where people meet, um, that's great. So that's what I wanted to add. Uh, and um, yeah, so now does still nobody has a question, then we will come up with something we start um, on asking you. Uh, probably you answered some of it already, but um, I think one question I, I think you didn't mention yet um, is, uh, do you have already like skate park um, planners or um, skate park builders who used your um, survey results or is it still like at your place and you working with it or, yeah. That's a good question. Um, we have had a lot of, uh, people reacting to it and obviously it's difficult to say if they're like actively working with it but we can see uh, that there is in you know I don't know exactly what you call it, like tender bids uh, like the um, when a job skate like a job to make skate park comes up we can see that it's uh, it's more often now that they talk about it should be an inclusive space so it seems like people like the reports out there and people have read it and it seems that people, ah, oh, maybe we should like force them to focus on inclusivity in this project, whoever wins the bid. So um, I, I can say in the Swedish Skateboarding Federation, uh, the skateboard clubs that are members in the Federation, uh, a lot of them have uh, had the report as inspiration when they're talking to skate park builders and to municipalities. But um, the challenge still is that it's a report and it's not guidelines. So it's easy for the municipalities to uh, have misconceptions and uh, have, the, it's hard for them to use it in, in a good way as it is now. Uh, and that, I think that's a barrier for us uh, at this point. And that, that's why it's so nice to have funds to be able to do the guidelines. So it's easier for uh, people to use it instead of just being inspired by it. Do you think that you might come into some sort of uh, 
conflict with the the com the requirements that I guess are coming in for like standardization for uh, with focus on the Olympics. So like you have to have a certain dimension bowl, you have to have certain elements in the park which would kind of mm. jar with what what you're doing. Uh, mm. It's something that sort of yeah, we we've, we've always been very very resistant to any sort of let's call them standards, like maybe, maybe guidelines is a better term to use because that's the last thing we want is for every bowl to be the same or every street course to be the same based on some imaginary Olympic standard. It shouldn't be like that. They, you know, they need to continue to evolve just like the sports can and, and the activity continues to evolve. So how do you, you know, create some, some guidelines or some bumpers of some bare minimums, but not create, the last thing we want to see is standardized skate parks that all sort of look and feel the same absolutely and that's what i love from what frederick frederick and nicholas are advocating here that it's a user perspective and like an adaption to the local community's requirements rather than an, a big overarching body's requirements yeah very very interested to see where this research takes you guys because this is it's, a, it's amazing yeah very very good tools thanks okay thank you thanks okay. Sorry, um, do you guys want to uh, do a little wrap up of anything else you want to say? So um, just so we can get to um, Altroot. Uh, yes. But that was awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the positive feedback. And uh, obviously, we'll, we'll keep you posted on what happens. And please feel free to reach out with, with, to us if you have any pointers or we have we have a an English draft that's not up to date. You can get that if you want. <laughs> and um, where can yeah. we get it? Just a quick one. You can email us. <laughs> um, yeah, we'd we'll we'll love to get our hands on it for sure. Can we, would you guys be okay with us attaching it to the follow up email for people, or would you rather do one on one, just people requesting it? Um, I can just maybe, share your email addresses if you. Maybe we could maybe we could actually spend a little time to update it and uh, within the week or something. With okay. maybe by the end of next week, and then maybe it's more of a real short version. It's a short version <laughs> in English, so it's not the full Swedish. Awesome. And on a related note, I put it in the chat, but um, we did we're doing this mini survey. Um, good push and uh, sit and skate and drop in and stay down. Um, so we did one last year and we put a report out, which some of you have seen, but we're running it again with some different questions. We want to get it further out. So last time we had about 65 or something responses and we're hoping to get it shared further. I know like the adaptive skate community is more than 65 people in the world. It's a global survey. So um, if people can help to share that, that would be awesome. It's quite short. Uh, so just to mention there and uh, also, so yeah, I hopefully people can stick around. Um, we'll go for another uh, 20 or so minutes and we'll hear from Altroot uh, next. And yeah, this has been awesome. So thanks everybody for your enthusiasm. Um, cool. And we can come back to some of the comments and questions after if there's time. So yeah, now I'll hand it over to Curtis Ruddle, who uh, I was talking to him earlier and he is a 16 year old um, who together with Matt Jantz, who's also here, uh, started Altroot last year. And this is an accessible skate park project in Calgary, Canada, that is for uh, the visually impaired. Um, the, the project wants to create a safe, accessible and inclusive skate park experience for youth with vision loss and low vision. And so they're doing hands-on research um, and they're hoping to create adaptations for skate parks that will help visually impaired skaters make the most of skate parks. So very interested to hear how they've been doing this. I don't know if you could call it like research. I think it's more like guerrilla skate park takeovers with neon colored <laughs> duct tape. It's a little, it's a little <laughs> punk rock on our end. But I'll, I'll start actually, I'm going to interrupt Curtis like I always do and start because I think <laughs> the story starts with my situation. So my, my name is Matt uh, Jans, I'm from Calgary. Um, and I also live with a, a condition called retinitis pigmentosa, which Justin, correct me if you're, if I'm wrong, but that's what you and Dan Mancina have too. We're all like RP buddies. Yeah. Oh, it's just not on. Anyway, um, 
Uh, my uh, journey into adaptive skate started a few years ago when uh, some good friends of mine, uh, Derek Epp and Jason Duick uh, from Skate Life, the not-for-profit Skate Life um, organization called Skate Life, they noticed uh, two things. This is really funny. One is that I was losing vision, uh, which I am due to my condition. Um, they were seeing me like run into poles and stuff or trip on curbs. But two, they were noticing that I was still skateboarding really aggressively. So they, they really empowered me to start a, a small club called Skate Bats, which is a a uh, skateboard club specific to low vision kids where I get to share my unique, I guess, ability as a low vision person who can still skateboard. I can share the joy of skateboarding with low vision kids, which is where I met Curtis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, that is where Matt and I met. Um, so kind of back into a bit about myself before we get back into everything. So, um, I was born with an eye condition called aniridia, which is essentially the loss of the iris. So, um, so this has left me with vision loss my entire life and leaving me with approximately 10% vision. Um, so I started skateboarding about two years ago. It was two years the other day um, with Matt and uh, Skate Bats. So Matt and his volunteers made this such an amazing experience and um, such an outstanding environment to learn in that it, I just was instantly hooked with it. Like it, it was instant. And um, that was my first time ever getting out on a board. And I remember Matt saying to me, are you sure you've never done this before? Cause you're so good. Um, <laughs> and so although Matt did such an amazing job of starting the conversation and the movement of accessible skateboarding here, um, it seemed like there, there could be more. And we, we already had a good foundation of where to start and we wanted to expand on that. So with Matt's help, I, um, I asked him if he would tag along and kind of mentor me and kind of help me out with that. And so I started this other portion of accessible skateboarding here um, as an accessible skate park project. Um, to help create a much better experience and add on to what we already had. So back to you, Matt. <laughs> oh, no, oh, it's, sorry. It's sorry, it's my bad. <laughs> um, and so then moving in um, to when we were talking about our research and development. So we, we thought about a research and development stage with um, our skate bats students that Matt was already working with. So um, when we looked at this, we brought our participants into a private um, facility that we were very fortunate to have access to. And we brought them in and we had them take a walk or a skate or whatever it may have been with minimal assistance and adaptations. And then we posed the question to them, if you could fix anything about the park, about this park to make it easier for you to navigate, what would that be? From these responses, we were able to get information and develop the adaptations we thought would work best for everyone involved. Um, and then we sent our participants back out through the park again with said, uh, said adaptations in place. And then we went and asked them questions again and gathered their thoughts and responses. And from that feedback, we were able to put together a list of adaptations that we felt were um, that we felt worked best for everyone in, in involved. Um, and some of these adaptations include high contrast guidelines and transition markers. So a guideline essentially meaning um, that you would set down. So we've been using bright colored fluorescent duct tape and just as it's temporary and we're still learning what we're doing and what works best. So a guideline would be showing um, someone with minimal vision, if I follow this line, I know I'm going to be safe and I'm not going to run into anything or however that may look. Um, transition markers have been a huge um, help as they help us understand where the transition is. We've found, a, we've created a method of um, a white color, not as aggressive, um, for flat ground and then something bright that pops like pink, um, a bright pink or orange works best for that transition. And then you're able to understand where it is so you can um, 
prepare yourself and work and be ready for it. Um, we found LED lighting to be a, a huge asset because it is so customizable to each user. Um, as it, you can change your colors, you can change um, your lighting, all of these different things. We've worked with haptic feedback strips so that you can understand where you are underneath the uh, underneath your board in the park. As I said, all of this is temporary at the moment, so that gives us the luxury of being able to figure out where these work best. We've tried them um, before ramps, after ramps, before stair sets. We've tried a bunch of different things. Um, and we've also been experimenting with sound beacons, which um, in our previous uh, showcase event, that, that didn't work too well. But now we, um, ha we have more ideas flowing, and I think we kind of have a better understanding of it now. Yeah, like um, it's it's funny the it's funny how it's funny how little the adaptation needs to be or how simple it, need, it is to implement to really help someone with as little as ten or five percent vision. Um, so like we're skating at these days we're skating at our Calgary's OG downtown park Millennium Park, which is just a big sea of gray. And to be totally honest, I haven't cruised through the middle of Millennium Park over the bump in like probably over twenty years, just because it's fast. There's a bump. It's totally invisible to me and I can't see it. But we go there these days like our with our summer program that we're creating just with some pink tape. And now we have all of myself and all of our kids cruising through the middle, no problem. And even with sound beacons outside, we had our last student say that we put a sound beacon out on, on the middle bump. And he said that that, was, that in, extra info was just so crazy input to help him get over that bump. And he did a, he did a huge ramp and a bump first try and I thought, I thought it would take him all summer to learn and he did it right away. So tiny, small adaptations opens up huge possibilities. Other success stories we have at, from our November showcase, from our last showcase event was, um, we had a, a brand new student has never really skateboarded before. He actually went down a big, the, the compound's big drop-in ramp um, and did a huge kick turn on a, on a big bank wall, just with like two transition markers and uh, one guideline leading him in and, and then out. So. Um, he worked on that for two months, <laughs> but then I, like I said, with just a simple adaptation, he accomplished this huge thing, which was really eye-opening for him. Oh, that's a horrible pun, eye-opening. Really uh, <laughs> revolutionary for him, um, but super simple for us to do. And I think it just goes to show you that when you open your mind to simple adaptations, I mean, you're just opening up a, a huge can of worms for skateboarding in the future. Not a can of worms. I'm bad with puns today. Uh, other success stories is Curtis's little sister actually went off of a kicker ramp with LED lights and a guideline and even uh, strips like a haptic landing strip area so that she could kind of see and put her wheels down on it and just know where she is and all that extra info. Super easy for us to set down, but um, man, it has it has a beginner skateboarder going off of like a one foot kicker. So, and she has how much like Curtis 10% vision you said? Yeah, approximately, um, yeah, kind of so. all around. Yeah, I go into so, like teaching low vision kids with very low expectations and very low pressure for the <laughs> for them. That, and then all of a sudden, like we lay some duct tape and they're like going off of jumps. So I'm I'm blown away. <laughs> so Curtis, what's next for us, man? Yeah, so kind of just want to reinforce that that idea of the adaptations can be so simple but yet so meaningful and so uh, helpful. But then. When we look for when we look further into the future and what's kind of up, um, so as we had mentioned already, we did a showcase event back in November, and that was our very first one. Um, as this project was started in um, August of last year, so now when we look forward and what are we up to? So we're happy to announce and um, make it public more public now. Um, we've recently built a partnership with the city of Calgary, and we're we're planning to um, take our adaptations downtown to uh, Millennium Park um, and have a showcase event, show the public what accessible skateboarding is and how it can be done. And just these low vision youth being able to cruise through this park, as Matt was already saying, um, and. It's, it's the simplest thing, just being able to show them uh, what, it, what it looks like, right? Um, so we're happy to be working with the city 
on that new project. We hope to be able to expand with them um, and maybe see where we can take this into other projects and maybe even in the future permanently. Um, different, a lot of different ideas flowing. Um, and we have a lot of community support around building awareness and increasing the idea of this. So we will get more into that in, in a bit, but. Yeah, um, and another thing we want to add on to this next showcase, that's in July, by the way. Did we say when it was? July 24th. No, we did not. Yeah, July 24th in Calgary. So watch out for that. We'll be, um, we'll be like blasting on a few different social medias. But what, one of the things, I don't know who was saying it, I couldn't see, but uh, these groups need to advocate for themselves at skate park meetings. Um, I 100% I agree. And I've always, I've already, I've already been saying for a few, I think months now that uh, if low vision people want to skateboard, they need to kind of advocate for themselves in skateboarding and just speak to what they need and stuff. So one thing I've noticed with our showcases, they're, they're great places for us to advocate for ourselves and to, um, advocate advocate for uh, diverse user groups in skate parks. So with our next showcase event, uh, we're hoping to produce a, a poster series with QR codes that links to an online showcase, which will then feature um, stories about disabled base, disability based skateboarding. Like we wanna have Dan Mancina's video parts up on our website. We wanna have Justin Bishop's work up on our website and stuff like that. And um, so like a poster series at the event that leads to an, uh, an adjacent, I guess, or complimentary online showcase that I think will really, we really want the general public to start to normalize in their own lives. The idea that skate parks can be accessed by people with, you know, disabilities that, you know, there's WCMX is growing so fast and we have low vision kids going off of ramps first try. And, you know, like um, my, my problem is as I have conversations about my work with people and it goes over their head. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this. They, they kind of say, huh, that's neat without realizing that we're creating the possibility of, you know, like disabled kids, like low vision kids in our instance, low vision kids might, might in the future have a career on a skateboard with global success due to things like due tour and, you know, the Paralympics. So for people not to understand the power that that is, the joy that that brings, um, the life that that gives, um, I think that that means we need to work more on advocating for ourselves and, and telling our story and, and normalizing the idea that I'm allowed to go on a bus with my cane and my skateboard and not get like harassed with questions about my vision. You know, like I want more normalization. So along with this new showcase with duct tape all over Millennium Park with sound beacons and all this beautiful color and these kids and skating, um, I also wanna be really focusing on a communications plan uh, that will help normalize the idea that skate parks are built for diversity, that they're so good for diversity and that we can really build diversity into them with just the thoughts of like people like you guys, like here in this meeting, really thinking about design in terms of like, now I'm ranting, I'll move on. Curtis, <laughs> I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> um, yeah, but tell us, tell us about the support we've received from our community here in Calgary. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, when we look at uh, the, the support we've received, um, a lot of this really honestly wouldn't have been possible without the support of the CNIB Foundation, which is the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, as well as their National Youth Council, which um, I'm a member of, so I was able to wrangle in some support from them. <laughs> um, and Rising Youth and Taking It Global's uh, grant program that we were able to put to use for a great cause like this. Um, but we also have been working closely with AMI, which is Accessible Media Inc. to put together a fully funded um, one hour long documentary special uh, based around this entire project. So everything as little as how this got started to our showcase event to even this um, webinar right now and our next event is going to be included in this, um, this documentary. So we're super hyped for that. And um, right now that's supposed to be coming out uh, later this summer, as long as there are no more um, disruptions in production. So uh, stay on the lookout for that. We're super hyped for that. And um, yeah, Matt will kind of tell you about the support we've received from the state community. Yeah, I have to say I'm really proud of uh, the skateboarding community because as soon as Curtis came up to me with this project idea, I just made like two phone calls, I think. Everett was one and Kevin Lowry 
and in instant instantly the skateboarding community just supported us like really really quickly even before um, the bigger site loss organizations like CNIB. Um, uh, huge shout outs to the Compound Skate Park that's run by Riders on Board here in Calgary. Um, they donated facility rental to us that is like way beyond what we could have afforded and they really made it happen for us. Uh, Nine Times and Kevin Lowry, they hooked us up big time with um, product for our kids to, to make sure their gear is good moving forward. All these kids had like Walmart boards or <laughs> boards with no grip tape and stuff. So uh, Kevin Lowry and Nine Times continue to help us out. And, and then Kevin Lowry he also hooked us up with Adidas shoes for the kids. So like crazy amount of support for like just brand new beginner skateboarders to really make them feel included in skateboarding despite their disability. And then also New Line, I have to shout out to Everett. He's been consulting for us and connecting us with all these events and stuff. And he's like kind of our community liaison much more than I could be. So so for, <laughs> for me and Curtis, Everett has really, I mean, we're going to be riding Everett's coattails for the rest of his life. So good luck getting rid of us <laughs> low vision kids <laughs> but um yeah uh, we're super thankful for all the support and um we're super we're not going to take the support for granted and we're like really happy to continue to make skateboarding work for ourselves so that we can so that skateboarding can then continue to work for other low vision kids in the future R right up to the do tour next year hey curtis <laughs> <laughs> that's what we keep talking about yes um yeah. no and all all of the support has been tremendous even from uh Justin and uh Dan as well it's just it's been uh extremely extremely uh bigger than I expected it to be this kind of blew up in our face more yeah. than I expected it to it just kind of took off and you no know, it's been amazing to see the the support we've received and the reactions that we've received as well so it's been it's been a wild ride but I'm I'm all for it Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Curtis and Matt. That was super cool. And um, I think on your website and your Instagram, there's some examples of your guerrilla tactics. Yeah. People can see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we have a question uh, or a hand up from Max Beckman. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, um, this is really inspiring, obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm really stoked because. Uh, uh, I'm in the business of skate park building and I've actually had like didn't have that on my mind I had like uh, I've heard of wheelchair skateboarding obviously we always thought about how to involve that and how to get like certain levels of skate parks and how to have that in our heads but I've actually never thought about this so like when New Line started with the longer curbs and having the possibility of having the stick to the curb this was like already was like uh well like really 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 cool to ha uh, to hear that and uh, to ha like have the opportunity to have that um, built into our parks in the future but like um what we already do quite a lot is um like have different um colors of concrete in uh, ramps and flat ground and i was just curious like how is it that must already help like in some way and like um, like what colors or like do how is the contrast especially important or what what can we like look at if we like build these kind of things and like also what we already do is cut like paint the copings and everything in, in a certain color like is we do use a lot of black for example or anthracite like like gray like how is is it probably better to have like brighter colors or how how, how, how like can we like adjust our like coloring of skate parks already like because that's usually in budget already so like this doesn't need to change anything yeah one thing i can say is i i love different color transitions like um new line mentioned Bam banff national parks skate park um where they they have dark ramps and the concrete colored flat bottom and i i can cruise at that park at full speed Whereas I can't do that at my hometown uh, downtown park because it's all gray. So those those make huge differences. The only the only problem that I see, Curtis and Curtis, I think this is part of your vision loss too, is even with different colored ramps, finding the bottom and finding the top is still unspecific to someone with vision mm -hmm. that is so blurry, right? Yeah, exactly. And um, a lot of it, something that we also kind of trying to work on 
um, going back to kind of Matt's success story here um, with my sister going off the jump, uh, off the kicker story, um, something, something about that is a lot of us um, with visual impairments struggle with our depth perception. So that's um, even just one foot drop, that's still kind of a kind of struggle. So some of these just smallest things like that. Um, so I think finding out where the bottom is and all of that is um, still very important. Yeah, so like different color transitions there, that's awesome. We love that stuff and it is standard. Like a ton of, the, like I think all the new skate parks are all different color transitions and stuff. If you, if you look at the image that's in the back of Canton's photo there, <clears throat> we're actually trying some different things on this park in Georgia we're working on where yeah. the floor pattern actually has a deeper contrast at the bottom versus, so the floor and the ramps are different, but there's actually a darker pattern that kind of highlights some of the roots through the park and, uh, and some of the, you know, the bottoms and the tops kind of thing. Yeah, bottoms and tops are huge just because, mm -hmm. just yeah. to really define the ramp, you need to super i don't know like make an accent or whatever yeah so even better would be to have like a line in the bottom and then a different color and then a line at the top is that right yeah that's kind of what we work with like with our duct tape lines we do like a, yeah. a big line at the bottom and a yeah. big line at the top yeah and even um as it was mentioned there is content uh like that on our on our social media on our instagram um, and you will be able to find one of those videos. We, we did that. So it's on our Instagram on and on our YouTube um, of just, as I had mentioned earlier, taking the participants in without any adaptations, asking them, and then, um, then inserting those adaptations. And you will be able to see how that works right then with that. I'm... That's thanks so much, Curtis. I'm just going to jump in real quick because I know some people probably have to go if you have other meetings. So um, I just want to take the chance. Um, Linda had a good idea. We're going to leave this open another half hour for whoever wants to stay and chat. Um, but for anyone who has to go, we just want to say thanks so much for coming today and uh, for joining in. Um, I don't know if there's interest to do another one. Um, we're also totally would be stoked if anyone wants to organize something <laughs> themselves. We're going to share the contact list, but um, if there's interest uh, in another web like online event or something later this year, I don't know. Let us know. Um, but yeah, I think there's different topics, so you can send uh, feedback by email. We'll send a follow-up email, and you can let us know if you're interested to speak or if you like. There's a topic you'd want to address. Um, yeah, we're just open to whatever people want. I don't know, Linda or David, if there's other things you want to mention at this point in case people have to go. Yeah, also I have to say thank you. And uh, Linda and me will keep the room open so uh, we can discuss further. Um, I think uh, we should really keep on going because just having these three projects and keep discussing, sharing um, what, maybe people in, in parts of the world already tried and then because it's try and error so we should keep sharing our errors as well so others don't have to make the same and yeah i would love to to keep this going and just um share more of experiences yep i have nothing to add but um, then we can just continue and chat and uh justin wants to say something uh, yeah, yeah, this is uh, to the uh, Curtis and Matt. Um, in your guys' program, do you guys also extend um, mobility and orientation training? Um, just like, I just know when uh, I walk and use my cane, it is like pretty different than when I skate and use my cane. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you guys do uh, mobility and uh, orientation training with uh, some of the kids to extend it from walking to skating. So... Um, kind of to build on that, um, I actually did kind of men mean to mention this while I was talking, but obviously I forgot. Um, but so to answer your question, we did have an orientation and mobility instructor come out um, the one time. I have a good relationship with her and she kind of scoped it out um, and saw what it was all about. No, we haven't done anything specific with uh, any of our participants in terms of teaching them that stuff. Um, Matt has taken them 
and started right from the beginning of teaching the smallest uh, how to get on and off your board and all of this safely. Um, but I know, I believe this was mentioned last time in the, the last webinar, but um, we have worked with the CNIB Foundation and we have, uh, they have um, asked us to put um, our adaptations. And so we created almost like a accessibility catalog, what is what we've been calling it. And we included what we uh, came up with in a, in a national document called the Clearing Our Path, which is essentially um, recommendations or standards of uh, indoor and outdoor uh, public space accessibility. So that's where we've gotten with, within that area, but no, we haven't done anything specific with um, them in terms of teaching orientation and mobility. I've done a little bit with ski bats. With, with kids who come in with a cane. I actually, I don't know if this answers your question, Justin, but we, I do like a little park tour, off, off board mm -hmm. park tour. And that, and that involves like a cane tour. Um, and then I've also been working on like, uh, we, we don't work with any fully, I've only worked with one fully blind kid before, but with him, mm -hmm. I, with him, I worked with, uh, for him to approach the skateboard with the cane and like feel where everything is with the cane so that he can so he doesn't have to like reach down with his hands and like feel where the board is and find the bolts and find the best place to stand. I've actually worked on the little, I guess, technique about finding the board, using your cane to find each wheel uh, up to either side of, on either side of the board. And then that where those wheels are, that's where the bolts are. And, and so there's a little bit of cane mobility that I've worked on with some kids, but um, it's not a big feature for all route right now, just because we're working with kids who at least have some vision. So uh came, came okay. for yeah yeah so i was just because you guys were talking about finding the coping find, finding the flat bottom and so with that's how i do it with my cane is you know it's extended yeah. so i was just curious if you guys work with that with the kids but uh yeah no i get it with a low vision they kind of don't want to use the cane yet i was just curious thank you i think i think my goal with adaptive skate parks especially as we advance into the future of like texture and tactile feedback and all this stuff is even if a kid is using, Justin, you have to tell me how you think, what you think about this. Even if a new kid is a full-time cane user, I'd like to be able to not graduate them, but like see if it's possible for them to put down the cane at a, at a, at a certain place in a skate park where they can skate through tactilely uh, and extra sensor, sensorily um, and kind of um, figure out a, a spot at a skate park where they can do it without a cane and kind of like free up their hands and stuff. I don't know how you feel about that, Justin, or if that's from your perspective as a, uh, as a yeah <laughs> i'm i'm yeah so like i'm i'm blind so like yeah, i yeah. would not like that and plus i've taken it's taken me uh you know years to get balanced while using a cane so i yeah. actually can't skate with a cane anymore uh, without one because my balance is thrown um i'm used to that uh two and a half pounds in my uh left or right hand yeah right so uh yeah right. Yeah, I'm not for that. Plus, I'm with you guys. Like any additional information, like if it's coming through my hand, my ears, um, and anything tactilely through the board, I I love all information possible. So yeah, if you're holding a cane, keep it. Yeah, for sure. And I think some of our like we had ideas about uh, like we we work with guidelines, but they're they're just flat. There's nothing texture to them. But I think this summer we're gonna start working with like a, a haptic guideline where it's um where you you know like if you're in amsterdam and you're on a sidewalk they have the guidance where it's like a hap yeah like a, a tactile and you and you run your cane over it as you do your own m sweeping i think i want to mm -hmm. try to start experimenting with a with a guideline that leads you through a nice safe route a safe route we call it um that you can run your cane over at first and you also feel with your board if you kind of wiggle back and forth too so yeah but, we, we've been talking about using different textures say like you have paving stones or something and as you're further away from an obstacle, they're bigger. So the clack, kind of clack, clack, clack is a little bit further apart. But as you get closer to a transition or something, yeah, the pavers get smaller. So the sound gets a little more like clack, 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 clack. You know what I mean? So that you yep. could you could feel and hear the approach to the transition. So there's lots of been ideas been thrown out, uh, things like that. But I want to do that with coping with like, like uh, if we're on a mini ramp and you're grinding across and you're getting closer to the edge. I want the frequency of that sound in the notch coping to increase or decrease. I think that'd be super cool too. Yeah, there's some of that notch coping in Banff too. In certain that, that's my favorite coping in Banff is the notch one. <laughs> but but I, I do think that us as designers and builders could, could 
really spend some time with blindfolds on trying to navigate a skate park or strap ourselves into a chair and try to navigate, like try to learn, you know, the, the experience. So, you know, we can, we can, we can hear from you guys and get this input, but then we, you can sort of teach us some of the things that you're experiencing so we can learn why these things are important, um, you know, to put into the designs and the details and things like that. So, yeah. So if you ever want to challenge any of our guys, you know, feel free. <laughs> yeah. Everett next time. Um, yeah. man. I, I would, I would love to ask something. Um, because what I hear a lot is that, um, the needs of, for example, wheelchair users and blind people um, cannot be uh, included together. I think we found solutions in the city building, so I think we will find solutions in the skate park design. Um, but what I uh, what I had in mind is, for example, that um, when I understand right, uh, I think Justin or Dan said that, but they need longer rails. Um, and of course, for, for us richer users, it's bad to have those long rails because we don't uh, can rip them the whole uh, on the whole length and we cannot jump off in the middle. So um, that's just one example. So um, I'm pretty sure we will find solutions, but I will just uh, throw this in and maybe New Line Skate Park can say something about their approach yet. Um, and I would just love to, to uh, have this in the discussion as well. Yeah, I, I think Everett kind of spoke to it. I mean, just more consultation, like every user group, no matter what, you know, has different needs and different, you know, wants and needs and things like that. And it's really just trying to understand what those are for each user group, right? Like I have three young daughters and the way they experience a skate park versus my sons or myself is very, very different, right? So I think it's just understanding, you know, first, like who are all the different user groups? Because again, a, now a skate park is playing a pretty important role in the community because, and this is what municipalities have to understand. It's not just one small niche user group. We're talking about like hundreds potentially of different, like, you know, you know things and, and people and, and, you know, types of wheels and things like that that are using these spaces. So just like, you know, you might have soccer players and football players and golfers are all using grass, but you put them all in the same space at the same time, you're going to get some conflict. So there needs to be more parks. The parks need to be bigger. They need to understand that, you know, in order to properly accommodate such a wide variety of not just sports, but, you know, abilities and user groups and all this kind of stuff. I mean, there just, there just needs to be more and they need to be bigger and more money needs to be spent. So, um, you know, I think Des Moines is just an example of sort of a starting point. You know, there should be, there should be parks of that scale and even bigger in, in every city. And there should be, you know, community parks, there should be neighborhood parks, there should be spots, there should just be more terrain in general. Yeah. There was a, oh, sorry, was uh, just Tracy is, uh, uh, had raised a hand, so. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, you know, my idea of just a little bit in every park, you know, and just kind of share like, like a normal community. And I actually, um, in the comments there, you know, when you guys were mentioning all this texture, I was thinking, you know, like all these, you know, the dots and the curb cuts. Well, for some of us, you know, we all have these different issues, but that sets off nerve pain. So I had this question like, oh my gosh, you know, does that slow down your wheels? And um, someone actually said, no, they're grooves. And I'm like, oh you know the relief in my heart just went yeah that's really cool so it's like you know all this all this different lingo and you know i just have to say that having these discussions and learning about each other because i have vision issues too i don't have peripheral vision i don't see down so you know having the coping a different color for me and also you know making sure that that we can feel the coping um, because I roll over it. So a lot of times I call it noping. So a lot of parks, you know, I have to you feel it before I use it. So I know that it's there. Um, so, you know, it's like, you know, every, we all have these different things and it's like, this is so amazing to, to see, you know, see it from, from everybody's different side. 
So it's, I just wanted to say that it's really cool because it's, it's, it's making me understand more. And I love the duct tape because, you know, that that's helpful for me too. Um, but also, you know, because I have a brain disease, sometimes these things, and it's like, you know, we can't have it all because sometimes when I'm in a park, a line looks like a stair. So for me, the hardest thing in a park is doing a stairway. So, yeah. I, some of you may have seen my miscount in Des Moines. I counted 10 stairs and there were 11. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's all good. I so, do have that yeah, problem, too. Yeah, you know, thank you for sharing all this information. It's like, I, I am like, I love this community. You guys just rock. I'm like, in yeah, we all have a lot to learn. And Curtis, Curtis, I, I am going to like find you on Instagram. You are a rock star, dude. Thank you. Yeah, no, um, for sure. Everyone, please connect with us if you are, um, if you're uh, interested in that. And no, it was so, it was so awesome to be able to speak at this today. So thank you for the experience. All right. Um, Can I that. throw in a comment here, if you don't mind? So, so I'm going to suggest that people think about the term robustness in in um, conjunction with the, the skateboard park. So the idea of robustness is that it can, it can uh, a robust skateboard park can handle a wide variety of people in different, uh, you know, dis different disabilities, different disciplines, whatever it might be. That is a robust. Uh, skateboard park and that's essentially what everybody's been talking about and and the the idea is that you know the more robust a skateboard park is the more people can use it and the less robust it is the more narrow the use is so part of that is so you're acknowledging that there is going to be an inherent conflict between certain disabilities and and, and people and so forth but we're saying okay it's not so much that we're just, because when we think accessible, it's really narrow focused when you think accessible. This is why I, I think the word robust would actually help um, with the, the development of, of the mindset or the thinking about these skateboard parks. Robust means as many people can use it in as many different ways as possible. So I'm just throwing that out there as something to consider for, for wording. Not sure, uh, since I, uh, I'm not a native English, so I don't know if uh, the word has another meaning in, in German, I think so. Uh, um, but I guess, yeah, that's the problem uh, we all already talked about, Eric, um, that may be accessible in, in a lot of eyes or ears uh, would say uh, accessible means that just the flat parking spot and no, it's not. So um, I, want, I think I, I said that earlier that we uh, don't want to have, or, or different people said that we don't want to have like a, a norm, um, like skate park has to be like that. So we wa want to have the creativity, skate park should be different. And um, maybe another word would help, but uh, what, and also the, the thing that um, uh, yeah that people need to advocate for themselves uh, of course, but we need uh, to to have those people and they can advocate for themselves in the skate park projects. Uh, we of course need um, accessibility um, at a ground level, and um, maybe we can find some other wording for the rest. So we have accessibility to the skate park and then in the skate park, we have robustness. I'm not sh still not sure about the wording, but uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about that. Yeah, that's fine. Our, our concept of going beyond ADA because that's, you know, applying the bare minimum standards, like you say, to get a parking spot and get to the park is one thing, um, but going beyond, it's really digging in to the user groups. And you had a great point there. Um, David, that, that sometimes, like we find it all the time, you know, especially in the early days, like all the older guys would come out and be huge bull advocates and their voice would be the strongest and the younger kids in the meeting wouldn't want to speak up. And even though like, let's say street skating might have represented 80% of this community, most of the vocal feedback that you hear is sort of, you know, 
and the voices that you hear are the loudest voices sometimes. So it's a great responsibility. Sometimes we have to look kind of between the lines and give people other avenues to provide feedback that's not just in the context sometimes of a public meeting and stuff like that. So the people who may not be comfortable, you know, speaking up in front of a room of, you know, a bunch of older adults who are very vocal kind of thing. So you have, you have to really make sure. And, and, and that's why I think just like conversations like this and consultation and sitting down and truly understanding everyone's needs who are potentially going to use the skate park you're not always going to be able to do everything, but we're going to learn, we're going to adapt and things are going to, you know, sometimes it takes time, but they are changing already. And, you know, I can imagine in, in five or 10 years, things are going to look way different even than they look right now. And things now look way different than they did 10 years ago. So. I've, I've really, uh, I've really enjoyed watching Matt and Curtis as we live in the same city um, do some of their adaptations because they really look, started from a point is like what's the smallest thing we could do to make this uh more available to us um you know that doesn't significantly impact the overall rideability but makes a massive difference for their specific user group um and those things hopefully will just become standard like what are the the smallest things that we can do and then allow that to evolve and grow into some of these larger concepts yeah, like I said, it takes like a strip of paint, I think, to include someone with 10% vision, you know, <laughs> so pretty simple, pretty simple work for like a big group of people who have been told all their life, you know, that they can't skateboard <laughs> by like these un un unrealistic perceptions. Can I jump in and, and make a, a comment too? Earlier, there was a, a suggestion about having um, adaptive athletes teach the designers. And I think something to consider also is having um, design be available to the adaptive athletes. Um, one of the things I worked on with Dan was a process that would allow him to um, redesign his skate park using um, sort of modular 3D printed pieces that he could move around and make a, a vacuum form impression of. But I'm curious for the the blind uh, skateboarders in the room, um, how do you contribute to design and what would help you with that? Uh, Curtis, I guess our, correct me if I'm wrong, our, our contribution is figuring out what works for us and then bugging Everett. <laughs> is that how it goes? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's how it goes. Um, and really um, contributing to it, I think, is just that, figuring out what works for us. And as we, as we said, um, at, like as I mentioned earlier, when we were uh, talking about the adaptations we've put in place, trying to find what works uh, best for each person. Um, like try, going back to kind of this, to the adaptations, when we want to think about that and what works best for each person, but then also putting that in together as what works best for everyone as a whole kind of thing. Um, just for example, one of our participants, he wanted, so we were using our guidelines. Um, he wanted a break in the line in between. Um, so it was essentially dotted line instead of a solid line because it was easier on his eyes, whereas others wanted um, a solid line. So. Uh, we had to figure out how to implement both both of those to be able to work. So I think going back to that, um, we have to figure out what works best for us, but also what works best for everyone else. And then we have to join the conversation and um, going back to what Mad said, Bud Everett, and just kind of talk to these groups and be able to implement that. Thank you, Lily. You've been next, right? Yeah, I just um, wanted to make note because obviously we're talking about accessibility. Um, that's obviously why we're all here. I think it's really important that we don't make an accessible skate park that is aimed for wheelchair users or an accessible skate park that is aimed for people with a visual impairment. I think it's really important that we make a skate park that has features for both. The whole skate park doesn't need to be accessible as long as there is features that we can all ride, 
I mean, right now there are a lot of skate parks where a lot of us can just go up and down a bank and not use the rails in the park. So having a rail that you could ride on is so important. And it's something that skaters would use too. Having a, a bank next to a quarter instead of a quarter the whole length of the skate park. That makes it so much easier for everyone to use, including beginners, as well as more advanced riders. Um, like I said earlier in the comment section, the best skate park is one that no one knows is accessible. So that doesn't mean labeling everything ADA accessible or wheelchair accessible. It's literally just having a few bits that you can, which means that wheelchair users can get around the park, that people with a visual impairment can understand the park better. It's like, um, I don't know how to explain it, but like you do not want to make the skate park easy. You, so we still want the challenge in the skate park. And like, if we were making the whole thing accessible, that's taking away the challenge. It's like having enough features so that we are all able to ride, but still have the ability to improve so we can use the whole skate park for a long time instead of riding it a few times and then being like, feeling like you've, you need a bigger skate park or you need more challenging obstacles or that like you've outgrown the skate park. It needs to be a skate park where everyone can still develop their tricks and it shouldn't be too easy to ride. There should still be some challenge within it. For sure. Totally agree. Um, I think, um, not sure uh, who said it earlier, but uh, I think the, the New Line guys uh, said that what was pretty uh, uh, well said that we need to have the um, beginners you uh, know we need to um, give them the opportunity to to step in to do easy stuff and to start and then of course they need to be room to progress and challenge themselves uh, when they are progressing and also um, the mix of ha um, having stuff for beginners and advanced uh, skater of every um, you know skateboard wheelchair whatever um, is very important so they meet each other so when when we would have a beginner park for example they would not meet any um, advanced skater that you know uh, but that's uh, also a very important part to to get the, the, the people into the scene to um, yeah to learn from each other so that's that's very important that we don't understand accessibility as um, keep things easy so that's not the case of course yeah definitely i think that everyone's disabilities are so unique and there's such a broad spectrum within all of us that it's also if like the skate park designers are wanting to make an accessible skate park it's the best idea to just reach out to the users people with different abilities because for example my idea of accessible wouldn't be curtis's idea of accessible we have completely different opinions of that and we can still try our best to include what we think each other would think of, but it wouldn't necessarily be correct. I mean, even with the other like visually impaired skaters, they probably still have different opinions on that. Because I know the wheelchair users and the amputee skaters also have different opinions on how to ride the park. I always like to use the example of like wheelchair basketball as well, because if you think of that, there's wheelchair basketball and then there's basketball. Everyone's, it's segregated, it's a segregated sport. But when we're at a skate park, everyone's like together. There's scooters, bikes, wheelchairs, skateboards, everything. And like growing up around that as well with a skate park, which everyone's able to use, is so important for the younger kids who are learning to skate because they're growing up around people with different abilities, genders, race, religion. And it just kind of slowly solves the like ableism, sexism, racism through the sport in general which is great really yeah we're, we're we're getting a lot of requests now um to try to create separate areas um and that's what frederick and they, they were talking about in their research which is amazing is this idea of like the front of stage and the back of stage you know a lot of people when they're beginning like you go to a lot of skate parks and you just feel like you're totally out there you're on display everybody's watching you when you're doing your line and just a lot of people who are, who are learning and stuff or being new, new to it, re regardless of who they are, what kind of, you know, devices on, under your feet or that you're using or whatever, um, having an area that's kind of separated, I, I mean, it helps the more advanced riders as well, because, you know, you don't have a bunch of little kids in your way or whatever, but 
starting to sort of separate these zones a little bit. So you don't always feel like you're on full display and everyone's watching you. You can kind of go and work on some basic things and then work your way, you know, kind of progress into the other areas of the park and things like that. So it's the same kind of concept with the whole system we were talking about, like, you know, at a neighborhood skate spot might just be a very simple set of features and, and very easy to get into. And then you get to a bit of a bigger park and then there's going to be more and then, you know, bigger park. And then you get to a big regional park where it's just, yeah, it's all, all different zones and set up and green spaces and all these kinds of things. So seeing that progression, not just in every individual one, but the progression in, in the system as a whole, making sure those opportunities are there. What I, I think what uh, really excites me from this development is the way these quote unquote adaptations will inform future des design decisions because it's gonna affect all the users. Um, and I could see some of these adaptive elements becoming really exciting for fully abled users, um, you know, where uh, a wheelchair and a skater are hitting the same obstacle. It's, you go to any skate park and you see, you know, the 40 year old man like me and an eight year old kid skating the same thing and just having a blast. I think speaking to what Lily is saying, that's where the beauty is going to come. Um, that, that some of these adaptive will create exciting opportunities for everyone and new ones that, that sort of haven't even been part of the, the public skate park realm yet. Um, I had a discussion with um, another skate park planner um, and maybe he's still on here. I saw him here earlier. So if you want to step in, you can. Um, because in Germany, we have mostly smaller skate parks. And um, here there's a problem right now that too many user groups and of course a lot of kids um, are just, you know, that's a challenge to have it in a small skate park, everything for everybody. Um, and right now it seems that like, we would like a skate park for all because we wanna meet everybody inclusion, you know, at one place. Um, but if the space is not um, giving the possibility, uh, sometimes, yeah, skate parks uh, are not that good for everybody. And maybe at some point for nobody, if there's, um, yeah, if you try to fit everything in, then maybe it's not worse for everyone, anyone anymore. So uh, that's the big discussion here um, too, we're coming up. So if you don't have the space, it's hard to fit everything in, but then of course it would be good to um, yeah, teach the, the cities, the, the, the councils and everybody um, who's giving the money and giving the space uh, that we need more spaces or bigger spaces. Um, and then of course, not every skate park has to have everything, but it should be of course, um, uh, well designed for the, for the uh, groups who will use it. And yeah, that's, that's a big challenge as well. <laughs> 